Thanks, you guys. Hey, I think it's a cool thing that we affirm people. How about we just affirm them? They're beautiful. I love that. I love when worship bands bring uh, acknowledgement to Jesus. It's a great song. That one is one of my one of my faves. It's an honor to be with you. As we were singing, I, I thought of the word generous. Um, it's not in my notes. It's not what I'm going to talk on tonight. But I was just... I don't know if it was a Holy Spirit moment or just the feeling that I have being around you that you're generous. I think the army is generous. I think, uh, as I mentioned this morning, I think it's generous that um, they resourced you with the memberships. I think it's generous that uh, many of you were given travel vouchers and scholarships to, to be here. I think it's generous of the way you care for people in your cores the way you welcome those who oftentimes are not welcomed by, um, by other environments. Um, I think it's generous the way that you give your time and resources to teenagers that are trying to figure out um, what they're doing in their life and what they're going to do that uh, you continue to pour into them. Um, I, just, I just think you're very, very generous. And I just want, as one youth worker to the next, I just want to say thanks. Thanks for the sacrifice to be here. This is a long time to be away for some of you, to be away from your families. Um, I think it's generous that you would even take some of your time to write one another affirmations. So I don't know what that, why that word was impressed on my heart, but I'm just sensing a, um, just a spirit of generosity, and I just want to say thanks. And so Jesus, I pray that you would take my words, as broken and as inadequate as they are, um, that you are the author of generosity, and that we get to be generous people because of your generous love for us. And I just pray that tonight, through the power of your spirit, that um, we might not be the same people when we walk out of here as we were when we came in. Thank you for your love, that your love is generous and we don't deserve it. Your love for us isn't based on whether we can sing or whether we can teach or what quality of youth worker we are, that you love us because we're your children. And right now we are grateful for that. Pray in the name of Jesus. While you guys were telling your stories, it's one of the reasons that I love being around youth workers. I've been a youth pastor full-time in the church for over 30 years, and um, when you were telling your resurrection story uh, for some, and the, the Spanish story and just the different stories, I just thought, that is youth ministry. It doesn't matter where you live. I mean, everybody is, people that do youth ministry, you don't have to love teenagers, you just have to be a little bit weird. Okay, and you have to like teenagers, and it's a generous gift that many of you are liking. It made me actually think of an embarrassing moment in my life as a youth worker. Um, it was a youth group time, and I, I'm a hugger for people that I know. So, like, kids are my youth group. I'm a hugger. Um, I'm pretty affectionate, but when kids come to youth group and I don't know them, I typically don't hug them because I think that's kind of weird and awkward and creepy that an old guy would just come up and because they're like, they have no idea that who I am or even what a youth pastor is. So if I don't know people, uh, youth group, I would just shake hands. And um, I went to shake this girl's hand and as I'm shaking her hand, I feel her taking her finger and rubbing the palm of my hand like this. All right, now those of you that are over 40 years old, you're going to have to confirm that the younger generation is not going to know this. But for those of you that don't know this, like in the 70s, that was a sign of flirtation. When you took your index finger and you shook somebody's hand, it was kind of like, hey, hey, baby, hey, hey, okay? Older people, am I right? Okay, see, when I tell this story to a younger crowd, they're like, no, you're making that up. You're just a pervert, you know, and, and it's, it's not true. And I've told people, you know, Google finger wiggle. Uh, but then, yeah, then I've, I've also been told you shouldn't Google that. So I, I go to shake this, this girl's hand and I feel her doing that finger thing to me. And I have flashbacks of like junior high and high school when I first learned that. And so I just, I pull back, pull my hand back and I'm like, what are you doing? And you know how fast your mind works? That as soon as I said, what are you doing? I realized I shouldn't have said it because this, this sweet girl only had like, oh, I know, I know I was there. I was there. It was awful. It was just awful. She had like two and a half fingers. I know. Would you? Gosh, now I feel bad telling the story. 
feel like a failure. I'm going to need you guys to affirm me afterwards, okay, no matter what. But, so I go, what are you doing? And then I catch myself doing that, and immediately, here's how dumb I am. I immediately turn, and I go, what are you doing, Billy? What are you doing, Joey? Hey, Sam, what are you doing? Tina, what are you doing, buddy? And I, I felt like, you know, maybe when I got up to teach, I should have said, you know, hey, today I've been kind of playing this object lesson called, what are you doing? And uh, today we're going to talk about what are you doing for Jesus, okay? Now, I mean, I think to myself, why didn't I just stop and just go, oh, hey, tell me your story. Because I'm an idiot, okay? That's why. Not even, uh, like, a month, three months ago, I was walking out of my church. We did this, I was teaching this membership class, and this older gentleman, I <laughs> walked by, and he goes, Hey, Doug. And I go, Oh, do you have a cold? And he goes, No, I have a voice modulator. You know, and he was, <laughs> I know, he had a little microphone on his, his neck hole, and I'm like, like, I'm in my 50s, when am I going to stop being an idiot? You know, I just still do stuff like, like that. It was about uh, 10 years ago, I live in Orange County, and so, uh, Southern California, for those that don't know, and I was in a mall, the Laguna Hills Mall, and there was this kiosk at the mall, and I, I saw all these people surrounding this kiosk, and they were looking at this this piece of art, there were several on each side, and they were staring at this art, and, and then all of a sudden you'd see them stare at this art, and they go, got it! And I'm like, what are you, what are you looking at? And I'm looking at this art, and it would look something like, like this, okay? Now, there is a technical term for this called the magic eye, and if you're not familiar with the magic eye, the magic eye is some type of, I think, demonic, uh, to our, where you have to kind of, there, there is a, there's an image within the image. And if you stare long enough, you, you know, you should be able to, to get it. And so there's all different types and this isn't it, but I thought <laughs> that's the kind that I can get right there. Okay. <laughs> but the ones that, the ones that I was looking at, the ones that I was looking at were, um, colorful and, and, and I, I had never seen this before, and people are going, yep, oh, that's beautiful. And I'm like, what? I don't, I don't see, I just see like somebody threw up a bunch, of, a bunch of colors. And then I think they're goofing on me, you know, like they're, they're, they're just making this up. And it's not, you know, like when, uh, you remember that um, uh, email that you'd get, and they'd say, watch this, and it'd be like a, a meadow, and you're like looking at the meadow, and then all of a sudden, like, Gah! you know, a scary face would come out, and then you'd, you'd urinate on yourself. Uh, I, thought, I thought it was that type of, type of thing. And and, um, you know, then little kids were the cockiest because the little kids that would get it, they would go, oh, you don't say that? You don't say that? It's so, it's so obvious. It's a, a warlock riding a dinosaur juggling puppies. Uh, you, you know, I'm like, no, I don't, I don't see it at all. But, so I kept going back to the mall like I was drawn by, by this. And my kids were like, Dad, come on. And I'm like, hey, here's 50 bucks. Shut up. Go, go shop. You know, because I'm going to get this. And then finally, finally, when I got it, oh, I was so excited. And the one that I got, the first one, it was like it was a pony and a rainbow, and it was kind of sissy. But I, I, was, I was super excited because when I got it, I went, I got it! I got it! And then I was like walking around the other one, and I had, for me, I had to tilt a little bit and then squint and then back my head up. I was like, I got that too! I got it! I was so excited. I was like that obnoxious kid in Chuck E. Cheese just like popping balloons. You know, I was that guy where I was just kept going around to the different pieces. I got it. Then I was even like mocking other people. Oh, you don't see it? <laughs> yep, I see it. Uh, and, I, and I got it. And what, what I realized is that what I needed is I needed a new perspective. And the more that I am around youth workers, what I realize is that I think youth workers need a new perspective. Honestly, you don't need a whole lot more training on youth ministry. You really, you really don't. I mean, there's so much training available. I want you to continue to be trained. I want you to continue to learn because I actually believe that leaders are learners and that when you stop learning, you're actually going to stop leading. But I think a lot of us in here, we need, we need a new perspective on family. 
See, we're talking about families at, at night, and I know Reggie, last night, he's a buddy of mine, and he, um, he just mentioned this a, a little bit, but this new perspective that I'm going to talk about, it actually, um, it came to me out of a bumper sticker. It's a famous bumper sticker, and maybe you've seen the bumper sticker. It says, Jesus is coming quick, look busy. <laughs> No, that's not the bumper sticker. Um, this, is, this is the bumper sticker that inspired me to think that leaders actually need to, um, to consider this. It's focus on your own damn family. <laughs> now, if I was speaking to my Baptist friends, I would have edited this. But speaking to the army, like, you know, this is in some of your song lyrics. So, you know, I... <laughs> I, I knew you could, uh, you could handle this. Now, the, the genesis of this message, oddly enough and sadly enough, was, was uh, in Colorado Springs. There is an organization that James Dobson founded called Focus on Your Family. And the community around Focus on the Family um, got inspired to come up with that phrase. And in that phrase, I thought, you know, there actually is really some, to me, there's some truth to that. And I wonder what our youth ministries would look like if you and I as leaders in here actually focused on our own darn family. <laughs> you know, as I listened to Terry this morning, Terry talked about you can only lead your students to where you have been. They're only going to be as mature as, as you're going to be. And I think about the kids in our youth ministries. They come from very fractured families. For some of them, you're the only together person that they know. Those of you that are married, you're the only healthy marriage that they know. They don't have a picture of family. And the more that I am around youth ministry leaders, the more I realize, wait, gang, we're doing youth ministry right. I'm just not sure we're doing, we're doing family right. I'm not sure we're doing marriage and parenting right. Now, those of you that are single, you're thinking, ah, oh, this would have been a great, great night to ditch. Okay, because he's talking, he's talking about my man. I'm, I'm single. I'd rather be at, you know, Chuck E. Cheese with a gaggle of five-year-olds hopped up on crack cocaine than, you know, than be here tonight. And if you're single, let me just say this to you. Don't check out if you're single because... It's actually when, when I was single and childless that I actually made a commitment not to allow the ministry to destroy my family. It was actually based really out of two fears, if I'm real honest with you. The first fear was my fear of parental failure. See, I, I witnessed a lot of youth ministry, uh, messed up ministry kids, and it was more than just the pastor's kids. But it was a lot of the parents who had worked in the church and in the ministry, their kids, their own kids, were growing up in some way kind of rebelling against the church. Kids didn't like church. They, they didn't respect the adults. Therefore, they didn't love Jesus. I'm like, what is this all about? These are our ministry leaders. There was a second fear, and the fear was just being a parent, you know, like with Kathy and I, we've been married 32 years, and um, our working with we had worked with teenagers before we had our own kids, and working with teenagers was our form of birth control. Okay, because it was like, really, do we want to bring another one into the world? Really, do we want do we want to eventually have another teenager? And then when Kathy would get that look, like, I think it's time to start a family, I'd just take her to McDonald's. And, look, and watch a Playland. Have you ever seen the McDonald's Playland? There's like three psycho kids that are naked, running around, throwing diapers at one another. You know, that would buy us a, another, another year. Uh, when, when, I was, when I was young and I was, and I was single in ministry, I was actually very naive when it came to church and church culture. Because I thought, uh, my first job at, at a church, I thought, oh, this is going to be great. I mean, everybody, we're going to talk about devotion. I mean, maybe, maybe we'll have um, quiet times together, and maybe we'll like, who's your favorite disciple around the water cooler? And I'm reading Leviticus. What are you learning? And, and uh, maybe there'll be a Bible in the toilet. Maybe there'll be a Bible, not in the toilet, but around the toilet. Uh, maybe even the Apocrypha, you know, and the Apocrypha will be there. And, and I just thought, you know, working in the church, um, 
I would be well respected and compensated for my <laughs> commitment to the next generation. And um, it didn't take me very long working in the church to realize that um, a lot of a lot of Christians are weird. <laughs> I mean, they really are. And I actually tell my my non-Christian friends, I don't. I actually don't think non-Christians are afraid of Jesus. I really don't. I don't think they're afraid of Jesus. I think they're afraid of Christians. Because there's a lot of weird Christians. You know, and then the people that interviewed you so kindly about coming to the, the, the church, they're, they're, you know, they're demon-possessed. You know, that type, of, that type of stuff. And what I've learned um, working in a church environment for 30-plus years is it has brought me some of the greatest, greatest joys in my life. It really has. Some of the greatest, greatest joys in my life. Some of the deepest friendships that my children grew up around. Some of the most amazing, you know, youth ministry volunteers. But it has also brought me some of the greatest heartache that I've ever experienced. Pouring your life into a kid thinking that this kid is going to be a disciple. Only to watch him walk away from the church. Or for her to have no moral standards or them to like the idea of... Uh, of church, but not the idea of, of Jesus. I learned that, you know, what we do is not always appreciated. That for many of you, you give your heart and your soul to your ministry. And it's not like teenagers, when you're done preaching your heart out, it's not like teenagers come up to you and go, that was a great message, Sandy. Wait, I love the way that you exegeted scripture. And, uh, I, you know, the way that you combined a little bit of humor with biblical exegesis, has, it changes how I live my life in junior high. You know, they're never going to do that, right? They come up to you afterwards, they're like, oh, can I borrow a dollar? Uh, you know, that type of thing. So, you know, what we do, there's, there's not a lot of encouragement. You want to be encouraged, speak to adults. Seriously, you know, adults, adults are an easier audience, and they're grateful, and they're thankful, but they're already saved. Uh, most of them weird, but but saved, and you know, and and you know, you have you have made a, a life, a calling, a passion of working with with teenagers, and you're not always going to be appreciated, and there's going to be backbiting and stressful situations, and lack of affirmation, and targeted gossip, and unclear expectations, and in youth ministry, the job is never done. It's just never done. You don't ever, you know, reach a Friday and go, all right, I'm pretty much finished. I've discipled everybody. Uh, you know, there's no sanctification left in, in this youth group. You know, I'm, you know. And it's just, it's stressful. How many of you would say youth ministry is stressful? Okay, you just agree? Yeah. Uh, what I used to leave, uh, leave the church office where we worked out of, and on the way home, when we had, our kids were little, I would stop at a Taco Bell, and um, I would get a large, extra large diet Pepsi, and I would read the newspaper. For those of you under 30, a newspaper is, um, <laughs> it's this you know, big sheet of paper with news on it. And I would, I would read the newspaper, and I would drink as many diet Pepsis as I could, and just for about 40 minutes to just detox before I went home because it was, it was so stressful. But I also know that in all of that, I know, I know, um, I understand church. I tell you that to understand, you know, I know that, you know, your cores are, um, and the cores that you look at and other people that are here, and we come and compare stories. And I'll just tell you this, everything looks better from a distance. Yeah, everything looks better from a distance. And so, but I, I know, I know the world of church, but I also know God's, God's word. And I can't overlook the, the clear expectations that Scripture expects of leaders, of you and I in this, in this room. That leadership is primarily example. We're called to live out and preach and teach and set a pattern for others to follow. In 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 9, Paul says that we're to offer ourselves as a model so that you might follow our example. In 1 Timothy 4.12, Paul says to Timothy that you're an example in speech, conduct, love, faith, purity, an example for others to follow. 
And I think, I think the leadership principle, principle can best be summed up in 1 Corinthians 11 when Paul says, be followers of me as I am of what? Jesus. Be, follow, be followers of me. And here's what's fascinating to me. When the Apostle Paul wants to find a way to illustrate leadership, he draws an analogy from the family. Let me say that again. When Paul wants to illustrate leadership, he draws an analogy from the family. This is 1 Thessalonians 2, 7. We proved to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly, tenderly cares for her own children. We were exhorting and encouraging as a father would his own children so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. See, friends, the image of a spiritual leader is not a company CEO. The image of a spiritual leader is like a father in a family, a, a good father. The, the image of a leader is like a mother in a family, a, a good mother. That a spiritual leader here, you're not, as a spiritual leader, you're not a primary producer of content or programs. A spiritual leader is not primarily a manager who can organize people and, and accomplish goals. A spiritual leader is one who lives a life worthy of imitation. Does that make sense? That's a spiritual leader who lives a life worthy of imitation. And our task as ministry leaders is to be the type of leader that lives worthy of imitation. And I think it's one who focuses on their own darn family. Now, I'm not saying we don't care for others. Of course we do. We're shepherd leaders. We care for families. If you want to care for kids, you have to care for their families. But if we're going to live lives worthy of imitation, we have to focus on our own family. See, it's easier to do, to actually do ministry. Um, it's easier for me to be doing ministry because when I'm doing ministry, um, you know, you'll, you'll go, oh, that was good. You get some affirmation, you get some feedback. You know, for some of us, we get our identity and what we do. And so when we're doing ministry, sometimes there's, there's feelings of accomplishment and we pull off an event or I taught that study or somebody, one of my leaders said, that was a good job. But then when we go home, sometimes the, the kindness is not as loud. The affirmation is, is not there. And for us, it's easier, it's easier for us to let our guard down because we're at home and there, therefore we say things we shouldn't say and we slip into actions and words. And, and you know, like I said, ministry... It's, it's not, it, it's all demanding. So you could be doing ministry all the time. I can't tell you how many, how many uh, times I would drive by McDonald's on my way home. And I would actually fantasize about working at McDonald's. Okay? <laughs> because it would be a nine to five. Now, those of you that are paid to do what you do in the church, has anybody fantasized about a nine to five before with me? Yeah, some of you, you have. You fantasize about that because ministry doesn't stop. But if you work at McDonald's, when you leave at five, it's not like you're, you're taking some quarter pounders home to work on, okay? You know, it's like you're, <laughs> you're, you're done. You actually, you work at McDonald's, you know, I would have seen manager, I'm thinking manager probably makes more than a youth pastor. You know, I wouldn't be eating pizza all the time, that's for sure. Nobody would call me at 11 o'clock going, you know, a couple Big Macs have fallen and we can't find the sesames. You know, they just, it wouldn't happen, right? And then when, when people at your core complain about the youth ministry or complain about the noise or complain about the mess, here's what I know about you. You take it personal. When people criticize the ministry, you feel like they're criticizing you. Not if you're working at McDonald's. You, if somebody comes up and goes, I hate the Big Macs, you're like, <laughs> me too. <laughs> Those two all beef patty special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. Who remembers that commercial? <laughs> yeah. Anybody memorize that backwards? Bun, seed, sesame, A, on, onions, pickles, cheese, lettuce, sauce, special beef all too? <gasps> <laughs> 
Yeah, I was, a, I was a lonely kid, had a lot of time on my hands. Yeah, don't have any scripture memorized, but a lot of Big Mac songs. That, yeah. <laughs> See, building, building into your own family. And again, those of you who are single, this is when you put stakes in the ground and make decisions for your future. But building into your own family is, is more time consuming because it, it, never, it never stops. And a lot of us in this room, you don't want to admit this, but here's what I know. Um, some of you are getting, giving better time to your ministry than you are your family. You're giving your best energy to your ministry and you're giving your family or your marriage or your parenting, you're giving it your emotional table scraps. That the church is getting, your job is getting the best. Now, don't confuse Jesus with your job. Okay? I'm not saying you take away from Jesus. I'm just saying that we have a job. And some of us are giving our best energy to our job and not, not to, our, to our family. And if your leadership is not... Um, imitation by example it's shallow it's it's empty it's it's show and if you're not living it out honestly you're just teaching theory and theory will not be transformational so really my challenge as we talk about family is to to focus on your own darn family to get to get healthy there and you're going to be actually a stronger leader for for your kids and to help you kind of remember this, I want to I wanna just give you some family actions. Some, I'm gonna, I want to take you into the family room for what I would call a couple, couple key, key points. First thing, I want to invite you into the family room, and as you're in the family room, I want to challenge you to change, change the channel. And what I mean by that is some of you in here, you're stuck on one channel. You're stuck on the channel of performance. You're stuck on the channel of pleasing. You're stuck on the channel of giving everything at church, you, you know, all your energy. You're stuck on the channel of um, expectations from other people that are unrealistic. And what I'm asking you is just switch to a different channel, to maybe some more realistic expectations. And it's not easy to do. These are what I call big boy, big girl uh, conversations. This is when the little boy sits down and the man stands up. When the little girl sits down and the woman stands up and you have conversations with your, your supervisors, and who may, many who maybe are managing you that are empty nesters and they have all the time in the world and you have little kids at home and you can't pull off the pace that is requested of you. Okay? And instead of having those difficult conversations, we just stay on the same channel and we wake up 10 years later and we wonder what happened to our marriage or our kids is that we've, we've got to change the channel. We've got to have those tough conversations. We've got to establish boundaries. And people say, oh, is that, is that hard? Yes, it's hard. It was easy. Every, I call them diarrhea conversations. <laughs> every, every, seriously, when I have to have a difficult conversation, I have diarrhea for about a week thinking about it. Okay, <laughs> I do. I just like grieving it like, oh, I'm a people pleaser. And what am I going to say? And how am I going to say it? And my body doesn't handle that well. I remember my first... Uh, church I worked at, the executive pastor, I was asking him about a day off. And he says, Doug, I don't take a day off because the devil doesn't take a day off. <laughs> and I was in my young 20s, and I was like, okay, that's good. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's good. Okay, you got me on that, you know. You know. You know, now that I'm a little older and wiser, what I wish I would have said is, Pastor, the devil's not my role model. Okay. <laughs> That maybe he wouldn't have been, maybe he wouldn't have been the devil had he slowed down or taken time off. And the Sabbath is not a, a suggestion, it's a, it's a commandment. And for those of us in leadership, changing the channel means some of you are on the channel of yes. Meaning you say yes to everyone and everything. And when you say yes to everyone and everything, you oftentimes say no to those who are the most important in your life. A leader cannot say yes to everything. One of the skills we have to develop as leaders is the skill of saying no. That's, that's changing the channel. And people pleasers, and that's what a lot of us in here are, people pleasers tend to go into ministry, is a lot of us in here are people pleasers, and we don't like to say no because we don't want to hurt people's feeling. And let's be honest, it's easy to say no to bad things. 
Like if you said to me, Doug, do you want to do you want to do a 40 day fast? I would say no. OK, the church, the church choir lady, the one who has nasty fingers, uh, she made a green bean salad. Do you want to eat that? No. OK, do you want to do a lock in with seventh graders and watch the left behind movies? No. OK, no. But but here's the deal, you guys. Life is not about easy decisions. Life is not about easy no's or easy yeses. Life is not, you know, should I pet a puppy or get a colonoscopy? Okay, you know, that's, that's, those are not the choices that we have. What's difficult, what's difficult is saying no to the many, many good things that come our way. Let me say that again. What's difficult and what leaders have to figure out how to do is say no to the many, many good things that come our way. And everybody around you doesn't want you to say no to them. They would all say, we want you to be a healthy leader. Oh yeah, man, that was great, Doug. We want everybody to be a healthy leader. Just don't say no to me. Don't say no to my expectations. And then what happens is when you're a little bit broken like I am, and you're a little insecure, and you want to please people, and then somebody calls you and says, oh, hey, Doug, you're the only one. Or, Doug, you you can save the day. And all of a sudden, that little inner Superman comes, I can save the day, you know, that type of thing. And I, well, this happened not too long ago, uh, maybe three, four years ago, a buddy of mine calls, And he says, Doug, there's this conference in San Diego, and Duffy was going to be speaking at it, and he can't make it, and a bunch of people have signed up for it, and they've already paid for it, and you're the only one who could teach that material. (laughs) Right now, which is, okay, you know, save the day, the inner, you know, weakling comes out in me because I want to please him, and I can save the day, and then he tells me when it is, and it is a... Tuesday night, which normally is a fine night, but my daughter was a senior in high school at the time, and she was a volleyball player, and they played on Tuesday and Thursdays, and I made a commitment to my kids I wouldn't miss their games. I'm not going to miss their games, especially senior year. And he says, we'll double your honorarium. (laughs) Well, now it's like, all right, okay, now now we need to really have a consideration, because not only will they double my honorarium, but when I go to my own daughter's game... I have to pay seven bucks to get into the high school to watch my own daughter play volleyball that we pay thousands of dollars for. But don't anyway, that's that's that comes up in counseling every once in a while when I have to deal with my my anger. But he says, you're the only one who can do it. Now, we have to weigh things out, right? Because a yes to him is a no to my daughter and the commitment that I made. And I'm not saying that was an easy decision. And by me saying no to him and yes to the game, it's not like my daughter after the game came, Dad, you're amazing. I mean, I just, I mean, I, I know that you sacrificed that deal in San Diego and you could have made money doing that, but you came to watch my game. No, but you know what? At the end of the day, my daughter's going to be in my life for a lot of years, and they're not. And by the way, guess what? They found somebody else who could do it. (laughs) Even though I was the only one who could do it. They actually found somebody else. See, there are little lies that are spoken that those of us that don't know how to say no, we believe those lies. Like the people in our our core that say things, oh, can I talk to you? It'll just take a minute. (laughs) Okay. That is a lie from the pit of hell. All right. There is no such thing as a minute. So Kathy calls and says, what time do you, you know, so gracious, what time do you want to be home for dinner? And I say, well, how about 6.30? Is that too late? She goes, no, 6.30 will be perfect. Dinner will be ready. Then I know if I leave the church at 6.15, if I hit every red light, I'm still going to pull in at 6.29, which means I'm going to make her very, very happy. And so now I'm walking out to my car and Mrs. Jones, who donated the carpet, carpet for the Mrs. Jones Memorial Carpet Room, uh, wants to talk to me and says, Doug, can I take just a minute? And I know that if I talk to Mrs. Jones, it won't be a minute. I'm going to be late at home. Not only am I going to make Kathy mad, but there probably won't be sex for a few days. All right, married people, you know what I'm talking about? 
Oh, that was an uncomfortable laugh. Sorry, gang. Um, but it's just, it's not going to be good for marriage, all right? Let's put it that way, all right? Now, does, does Mrs. Jones care? Not really. And I'm not going to tell her what I would miss out on, okay? But, but, I'm also, I need to say, Mrs. Jones, I would love to talk to you, I, but I made a promise to Kathy that I wouldn't be late. Can I please call you tomorrow? Okay. And, you know, if you can't say things like that with love and a shepherding heart, then you're probably never going to be an effective leader, the type of leader that is worthy of imitation. Some of you are stuck on a channel, and it's a yes channel. And I'm asking you, when you focus on your own family, you've got you to gotta change you got to change the channel, okay? And, and then a question I might ask you is, what's the worst thing that could happen if you say no? To me, like, oh, I'd lose my job. Oh, my friend, that's not the worst thing that could happen. So you could lose your family. You could lose your marriage. You could lose your reputation. You could lose your legacy. Your job is not losing that. It's not the worst thing that could happen. Okay? So if you're going to focus on your own darn family, I want to invite you to change the channel. I want to also encourage you, secondly, to unplug from church. Okay? That some of you in here, you are having an affair. And the affair is not with another man. It's not with another woman. It's with this little device right here <laughs> that you love it. You, you can't go anywhere without it. You keep it turned on all the time. You want to make sure it's charged. You even take it to um, intimate places in your life to when you sit on your throne and you take it with you and you, you fondle it and you fear when it is going to be, where is it? And you have to know where it is at all times and you can't have a conversation without looking, looking down at it. Now, I'm not asking anyone in here to become Amish, <laughs> all right, and run from technology. I'm just saying that there are times in a leader's life when he or she has to unplug from the craziness that is happening out there, and actually, you have to be home, where you can be available for your kids and your family, and I'm not talking about you go home and check in and have a quick meal and then boot up your, your computer again that you need to make home a place that it's safe, that um, maybe even find some, some media-free moments where you are totally unplugged and you can retreat. See, your body can be home, but your heart and mind can still be at ministry. And Kathy has had to help me over, you know, sometimes she has to remind me that I'm home, and she'll say things like, Doug, it's good to have you home. She just, you know, don't we have a beautiful home? The kids are so happy that you're home. You know, she just has to re remind me. And, uh, you know, there needs to be a time in every leader's life where when you are silent, by the way, you can't be a healthy leader without silence in your life. Okay. Silence is not native to our soul. We have to work for silence, which means there are times when we have to use the power button. And we need to not always be checking Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat. And, you know, you don't have to reply to a text right away. You can actually, you can actually turn those things off for a little bit. And for those of you that wear the earpiece out in the, out in public, um, you're a dork. Okay. I don't, I don't know how to say it any other way. Because it's just communicating. Now, in your car, I get it. You know, uh, we, California, you're hands-free. Wear it in your car. But when you're with your family, when you're with your friends, it just communicates like, I'm all, I, look, I'm just always available. Just one, whoop, boop, there it is, you know. No, I mean, if you're protecting the President of the United States and you have it in your ear, great. Okay, if you're the ShamWow guy, and that's part of your job, all right? But if you wear it out with others... You're a dork, okay? It was never, I don't ever think that was a cool look anyway. It's kind of like wearing sweats with a belt. That was never cool, okay? 
it's kind of like wearing Crocs with socks, okay? It's never, actually, it's kind of like wearing Crocs, all right? They're just never cool. So, so take it off and, uh, and put it in your fanny pack, all right? Because that... Those of you that have uh, children, young children, raise your hand, you have young children. Let me just give you a challenge. I would challenge you that um, you make a rule, and here's the rule, that anytime you're in your car, you're not on your phone. Okay? Now, I challenged my, my church with that, and you should have seen them. I mean, they were like, oh, no, oh, we'd rather tithe more, you know, that type of thing, okay? <laughs> But here's the deal. If you have your own children in your car, they're trapped, okay? And you've got a built-in audience to disciple them and talk about the things of the Lord or just talk about life and enjoy them, sing songs. I mean, when they're little, don't take the time and be on your phone. We just made a rule that never, daddy never picks up the phone unless it's mom. Okay, that's the exception. Because what's happening is you're actually training your kids to use this device in the car. And then when they get a phone during their preteen years or teen years, and they're in your car and you actually want to talk to them, guess what they're going to be doing? They're going to be on their phone, not talking to you at all, because you've tutored them and mentored them how to escape with this little device. So I would encourage you, you know, nobody is saying this kind of stuff in the world of faith. I think, you know, if you want to be uh, focused on your own family, when you're in the car, get, make a rule. Don't, don't get on the phone. And then you're going to model to them and you're going to thank me in years to come when your kids are actually talking to you because they're, they're, they're trapped. Yeah. <laughs> now, I realize there are crazy seasons in ministry. And sometimes in a crazy season, you need to go a little above and beyond. I understand that. I worked for two churches in Southern California for 11 years at one and 19 years at another. At both time, both of those churches were the fastest growing churches in the country. So I understand pressure. I understand capacity. I understand what it takes to build the church. But I also understand that Anybody can do your job. Anybody can do your job. And, um, but nobody, only you, can be the spouse to your spouse or the mom or dad to your kids. Only you. Anybody can do your job. See, the first church I was at for 11 years, I probably stayed a year too long. I didn't listen to God's spirit. I fought it. I thought the church needed me. Because we had a couple pastors who had had affairs, and I was kind of the wonder boy at that church, and I was preaching a lot, and I thought, man, two pastors are already gone. If I leave, this church is going to fall apart. And I shared this with a mentor of mine, and he says, Doug, do you have a bucket? And I said, yeah, I got a bucket. He says, I want you to go home tonight, and I want you to fill up that bucket with water, and then I want you to put your hand in the bucket and pull it out real quick. And the amount of time your hand leaves a hole in that water is the amount of time you'll be missed when you leave this church. <laughs> yeah. He didn't have the spiritual gift of encouragement, all right? <laughs> but he had the gift of prophecy because after leaving after 11 years, didn't miss me. They moved on. Why? Because ministry continues and you and I are replaceable in our job. After 19 years at Saddleback Church in Southern California, my pastor says to uh, you know, the whole congregation, you know, Doug Fields is one of my very best friends. Well, that was a working definition of friendship. Even my daughter was in college at the time saying, Dad, why did he say that? And I said, well, baby, I, I am. Well, we worked together for many, many years. But, you know, I, first year I was gone, you know how often my best friends called me? just when they needed me to speak at something, okay? And so um, you got you to gotta unplug. The church is, is going to continue. There are other people who can shepherd the flock, other people who can speak, and other people who can lead, but no one can lead my family. No one can speak into their lives and shepherd their hearts like their dad. So you unplug and be at home. 
Now, let's get a little more positive, and this is why this is in color. I want to encourage you to serve ice cream. Okay? This is my, this is my picture for fun and privilege. I think if your kids are growing up with mom and dad in the ministry, that they ought to look at mom and dad being in the ministry as a cool thing. And I think you ought to take advantage of the opportunities that you have, the freedom in your hours, the, uh, the flexibility in your schedule, the, uh, the people that you're around, the keys to the church kitchen. I mean, I, you know, when my son, we'd, we'd have... I'd, we'd sneak into the worship center and play Capture the Flag on his birthday with his buddies. And he thought it was so cool that we'd go to the church at, at, at midnight. Um, you know, we, we played a lot because that was part of the, the, you know, the environment is I wanted to, uh, you know, we didn't serve ice cream every night, but we snuck into the church kitchen a lot. And at our church, we'd have a little, we had a little tiny green room that had uh, treats in it. And I'd always walk them back. And when they, before they could barely talk, they'd go, ginks in the green room. And we're like, what? Ginks in the green room. It was drinks in the green room. Uh, and that was when she was in high school. She said it that way. No. <laughs> but, um, you know, we'd have, we'd have the vol- high school or junior high volunteer meetings at my house. And so that my kids were rubbing shoulders with just amazing people. We put bubble, you know, bubbles in the baptismal. I mean, you know, it's just that, that kind of stuff that I, I, I think as leaders, that's part of living a life of imitation is, is having fun with your family. That ministry is difficult work. And when you can get away and play and escape with them. And when they were little, it was, I would pretend knock on the door and it was Mr. Tickle arrived. Uh, you know, I limited when they were little, when they were older, that got creepy. Uh, but, you know, we had a, we had, we, we didn't play hide and seek. We played hide and scare. And it's still to this day, my kids are 28, 25 and 22. Two of them are married. Anytime somebody comes over to our house, somebody's going to jump out of a closet or underneath something just because that's the environment that we set. And here's what I want to say to you as a friend and brother and fellow youth worker, your, your core is not going to change. Your expectations on you are not going to be reduced. Your colleagues are not going to slow down. That if you really want to focus on your own darn family, you're the one that's going to have to make some changes. You're the one that's going to have to put a stake in the ground and say, I just can't keep at this pace. I've become a text message spouse or a drive-by friend. That you're a mile wide and an inch deep, both emotionally and spiritually. You're too busy. And busy people are broken people. You're broken somewhere. Okay? That Don't wait for other people to change. That's a remedy for disaster. Is You've got to make some, some changes. And we are to imitate Jesus. And Jesus left people unhealed. Jesus walked through communities and didn't meet everyone's needs. He didn't answer every question or go to every event. Jesus said no to good things, to significant things, to important people. And Jesus had a lot to do. I mean, you try being the savior of the world. Oh, wait. A lot of us in here actually try to be the savior of the world. And... I want to say to you, there's one Savior, Jesus, and that's not you. And if you're going to focus on your own darn family, you're going to need to learn to say no so you can say yes to your family. What this means, just going practical for some of you, you may need to call a spouse tonight and, and apologize. Ask for forgiveness for marrying the church You may need to journal and put some thoughts together and have a meeting with your supervisor to talk about what's been happening in your heart. See, the church is a great place to pretend, but to kind of come clean. You may need to repent that you've been neglecting your your family and make some drastic changes. You may need to invite some people into your life who you can actually be honest with and have, have them hold you accountable. See, I want you to hold your kids more than you hold your phone. You know, I want you to be busy with fun and memory making rather than be busy with with email. 
I want you to date your spouse rather than work on another program for your, for your ministry, is I want you to focus on your own darn family before you focus on others. Does this make sense? Okay. Now, it's not easy. It's a balance. It's a journey. It's ups and downs. It's three steps forward, two steps back. And I just want to invite you in this moment is if you'd say, you know, Doug, I, I actually need to make some changes. And um, for some of you, they might be little tweaks. For others of you, they might be radical changes. But um, I want to just challenge you to stand up, that if you need to make some changes, that you're going to go public and you're going to you can follow up with what those are later. And I just want, I want to take this opportunity for those who are standing to, to be prayed for, okay? That you're saying that, you know what, I need, to, I need to make some changes in how I manage my time related to my family or where I put my focus. It's, it's a courageous thing to, to do this. You know, most of you came with other people. And I would encourage those of you who came with other people that if you see one of your brothers or sisters standing, that you don't let it go unspoken. I mean, by standing, you're saying like, yeah, I'm, I, I need to make some changes. It'd be a great conversation to have. How can I help you? How can I pray for you? Okay? Anybody else? Okay. Um, here's what we do in our church is we just extend a hand of blessing to those who are near us. So I encourage you to do that. Just extend a hand of blessing to, to, these, to these folks who are standing. I encourage you to follow up with conversation to them. But Spirit of God, you know what is happening in the hearts of every one of us in here. While it may be a mystery to us why people are standing or why people are sitting and should be standing, it's not a mystery to you. And so we pray that through the power of your spirit, you would, um, you would help us to be the type of leader that is worthy of imitation. That Jesus, ultimately, we would put you first. Then we would put our family and then our ministry. And there's a lot of us in here who've got our priorities backwards. And because of that, we're, um, we're wounding relationships. I pray for those in here who are single that maybe not feeling like this was all that relevant. I pray that through the power of your spirit, you'd bring wisdom and conviction and maybe even future healing to them, that they might, um, they might really consider what kind of marriage and family that they want. I know so often, Jesus, I've had a Messiah complex, thinking that I was the one who could save the day. I'm the only one who can teach that lesson or solve that problem. And I pray that you continue to bring healing to me and my brothers and sisters as well. I pray that people might be drawn to the army because of the vibrant families, the light that is within the marriages, the way these moms and dads parent, that people are like, what is different about you? And that in that, they might be drawn to you. So I pray specifically for these that are standing, that you would give them a wisdom that is greater than their own, that you give them a courage that is braver than their own to make the decisions for the changes that you've put on their heart. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. And God's people said, amen, amen.